a good Jewish answer. It is a good you, Jewish answer. You expected that one, right? Yes. Well, I'm Jewish, so of course I know that. <laughs> but I'll explain why. Okay. Uh, My friend Kathy and I are I artists, so we are going to have a lot of technical questions. Well, I'll do my best. Good. Absolutely. I don't want to cover your screen. No, no, no. Don't worry about me. I'm looking at you here. Okay. And there's a camera up there. So come right. in as much as you can. Okay. I have an interesting thing that if I see something, if I don't fix it straight away, I'm going to forget I saw it. Very good. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay. So my name is Rabbi Druin. Um, I actually live in Miami. Oh, that's where I live, North Miami Beach. Um, I'm married, eleven kids. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Come join the gang. Um, I travel literally every single week, other than holidays and things like that. But it's, it comes out to about forty-seven weeks a year. So that's a lot. Yeah. Um, and I do exactly this. I am primarily either restoring Torahs um, with a lot of education, but also we do a lot of new Torah projects, new campaigns for communities. Um, I think especially now coming out of Corona, um, doing this for 41 years, there's never been a time in history where more communities have been writing new Torahs. Not only because, oh, we need a new lightweight Torah or because we don't have enough Torahs or whatever, or someone wanted, but simply because they wanted to create a program to bring people out of their homes and back into the building mm. in a unifying way. Because if you just say, hey, we're gonna have a bingo night mm -hmm. and we're gonna have a dinner, you have something that is monumental and so emotional and so inc inclusive of everyone that's why communities are writing Torahs. And, and many families are writing their own Torahs as an heirloom for their families. Oh, that's wonderful. And they're saying, well, whether because it was for someone that they, a relative or someone passed away, they're saying, you know what, we need to, because with this new generation, with technology, people are getting loose. There's a lot of apathy, just whatever, I'll do what I want as I want. And to try to create a family core that no matter what you do and how you go, but there's a core that you're attached to. So that's why families are writing their own Torahs, including their kids and their grandkids in the process of writing. And then whether they have it permanently housed in a congregation or you know a school or whatever, but it's their Torah, which basically is now an heirloom. Some are writing smaller scrolls and actually creating little arcs and putting it in their homes. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a full heirloom. So it's not just the Torah, but it's actually the housing of it and so on. So that's really a lot of what I'm doing. I'm traveling every week to facilitate these type of activities and programs and, and so on. And it's not just myself. There's my son-in-law. My father was doing it up until not too long ago. Um, and I have other scribes who are also traveling. It's, it's, there's a lot that's being asked and looked after. Um, maybe I'll share with you, since we're on the topic of becoming a scribe, and as you may have just heard, so my father's a scribe also. Um, but what most people are not aware of, and it doesn't normally occur to anyone, and that is that traditionally, it's not by any means the only way it could be, but traditionally, if a father is a scribe, that person would be the one to train and teach and pass on to the child. Sometimes it's a person could just learn by themselves, but then they're starting the process. Um, I'm a scribe, my father's a scribe, but I was my father's teacher. And in fact, we are the first pair in history, we've checked this out, where the son taught the father the art of being a scribe. Can a woman be a scribe? So that's an interesting question. The answer is yes-ish. <laughs> you, you're very Jewish, aren't you? <laughs> okay, so what's the yes-ish? Of course. However, like anything, there are multiple laws and environments in which Torahs can and should be written. Um, and that's just the way it is. And by the definition of the different elements of males versus females, so there are times when the female can become impure and be in a state of impurity. So as a result, 
it's more traditionally that such a such a art doesn't often happen because the lady doesn't want to be in a position and say, oh, I'm now in trouble. But so therefore, well, where's the yes? So therefore, technically, and later on, now you've removed the, the core issue, if you will, right. that can cause a problem. So then technically, hey, we know daughters of Rashi, but I mean, there's enough other past sources of involvement. Um, again, there, there's something that said it's, um, what's the word? Um, it's permissible, but not always is it something that's acted upon, mm -hmm. okay? As a result of external reasons, but not. So my in interesting early story was, um, it, was, it starts off about when I was seven or eight, growing up in Israel, um, not in a religious village at all, we weren't observant. I'm not sure if you've been to Israel, if you're familiar with a little city called Tiberia, Tiberias, on the Sea of Galilee. Um, so a few miles up from there is a little village called Migdal, and that's where I grew up. It was a Sephardic village. There was only three Ashkenazic families, and we were one of them. Until 13, I was sure I was Yemenite <laughs> because I grew up amongst all Yemenites and you know Moroccans and Tunisian Jews. And one day, and I don't even remember how I found it, but came past me a page, a photocopy of the Hebrew letters as they appear in the Torah. Just a photocopy. I'd already been an artist from a very young age, drawing and fascinated going on mountains and drawing sceneries and whatever. And um, I started copying and writing these Hebrew letters with my pens and my markers, whatever, once, twice. While everyone in class was scribbling scribbles, I was scribbling Hebrew letters. Jump ahead about 10 years later. So now, without getting into how this ultimately unfolded, I'm starting to become much more observant. I'm in yeshiva now but I'm also a cartoonist and I'm starting to draw funny faces of all the rabbis got kicked out of yeshiva. <laughs> they didn't like it. Um, I was a good boy. I never rebelled or did anything, you know, mischievous, but my artwork was not always the, the most pleasant to the, the powers that be. Um, well, they brought me back in and they said, Maisha, you should ultimately become the ultimate Jewish artist, become a sofer, a scribe. So for that, you need to be holy. It's not so easy. It's not. You know. But I was given an opportunity to try it out. And I was like a fish in water because I had already had the image of those letters so engraved, engraved in my mind. I mean, I often do scribal classes where I give people the sheet and I give them the feather and I say, OK, here it is. Copy. And it's ninety nine point nine that people just make one big mess. <laughs> To even get anywhere close is so extremely unusual. To be able to take a quill, sit down, and practically start to write or just outright is extremely unusual. So I became a scribe very quickly. And normally, while it takes anything from one to three years of training, within three months, I was writing completely outright, ready to go. So I'm not the rule of thumb. So if someone says, how long does it take to become a scribe? I say, I'll tell you what everyone else does. <laughs> Now, I'm sure you are aware that there are four objects or that a sofer has to write by hand on parchment. What are they? Oh, I saw this yesterday. The Torah. Good. Mezuzah. Good. Uh, the Book of Esther. Right. And the Tefillin. You're doing good. <laughs> Check. <laughs> Phew, someone was listening. <laughs> wow, okay. Which is the first one that a scribe would write? When a scribe is training, learning, which would be the first one? The Vester. So the answer goes as, that, as follows. It's actually, again, a very simple concept as far as an answer goes. And that is, well, just to write a little small mezuzah scroll, it takes over 4,700 Jewish laws to study, learn, and pass the test, okay? We're talking about an ex extremely large amount of information. And yet the one primary concept that a scribe is training and learning, and that is how to become someone who does not make mistakes. How many people can, 
their claim to fame is you're looking at someone who mm. doesn't make it. <laughs> but I'm one of them. And why is that? We're human, we all make mistakes. Mm. And the answer is, is because we don't want to come in any situation to write and come to God forbid, making a mistake in writing God's name. So we're going to do all what it takes to make sure that we're so good that we will never find ourselves in a situation where, oh, we just do average mistakes. Oops, I made one in God's name. And now you're in a very big halachic, spiritual mess up, to say the least. So to refrain from getting into those situations, we practice and practice and practice and practice until those who are training are now satisfied that we're ready to move on. So in practice, which would be the one of those four that doesn't have God's name? You got it. The book of Esther. So you can write the book of Esther once, you can write it 20 times, and never, ever will you make a mistake in God's name, ever. <laughs> this doesn't have it. So many scribes, in fact, will write 20, 30, before they now are qualified to go on and write their first mezuzah. So those who are training will check it once and say, okay, you had a few mistakes. Okay, we're getting there. We're, keep on going. <laughs> and it takes about a good three months to write a Megillah. So we're talking about a long, there, there's your time. It takes a long time to get to the point where those who are training say, okay, we're going to, in Yiddish, it's called a tzetel, a little note saying, okay, move on to the next stage. I have an interesting story related to that. So I'm in yeshiva. I'm a young, young man in that 18-year-old area. And I'm writing my first Megillah. And those who are around me saying, Psh, that's looking good, now, being a scribe is not just art. You got to face it. It's a parnasa. It's a way of making a livelihood. And in those days, I was becoming very close to the late Lubavitcher Rebbe. That's where the yeshiva that I was in New York, in Israel. And I wanted to go travel to New York from Israel to visit him for the first time. I'd never been there. A ticket in those days in the early 1980s was $850. That was how much the ticket cost. So I said, one second, to write a Megillah and to sell it. <clears throat> I've seen Megillah sell for a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand, eight fifty, no problem. So I write my Megillah, and those my friends around, say, oh, she's yafim, oh, it's beautiful. So I start showing around to different people, potential, you know, married people who would like to buy a Megillah, and they'd look at it, mm, nice. And the first question they would all ask me because they saw they saw I was young. Um, how many Megillot did you write? And instinctively, I would say, it's my first one. They say, okay, um, we'll give you $75. <laughs> I said, you mean 750? No, no, 75. I said, kidding me? <laughs> when you, after your 10th one, come talk to me and we'll discuss a better price. <laughs> okay, but your first ones, we know that everyone makes mistakes and there's scratches and there's this and no one can see it, but it's a Megillah that is not written properly because it's your first one. Every software is going to make problems. And I wasn't taking that. So I started making photocopies and faxing them around to places that I knew in the hope that someone would be interested. I get a call from someone in Tel Aviv and he tells me he liked the McGill. And by the way, the most I was getting offers where I was, was about $150. That was the most top. And I was not taking that. And I was very disappointed. I was sending out faxes and someone from Tel Aviv said he'd give me $250 if I bring it to him. And he likes it, he'll pay me $250. And this was already a few weeks into my <laughs> attempt to sell it, and I was getting desperate. Um, and sometimes you have to cut your losses and move on. So I get permission from the yeshiva, and this is a true story. I'm on the bus on the way to Tel Aviv. On the middle of the ride, someone gets on the bus, and he sits down next to me. And this conversation unfolds in Hebrew. And he says to me, hmm, are you a yeshiva boy? I said, yes, I am. So he says to me, so what's a yeshiva boy doing at 12 o'clock midday going to Tel Aviv in the middle of the day? You're bunking, you're <laughs> skipping mm -hmm. classes, you're going to the beach or something to that fact, right? I said, no, I'm a sofa. He says, you're a sofa. What do you write? I said, I wrote a Megillah. He says, so why are you on the bus? He said, I'm going to show it to someone in Tel Aviv and he might buy it. I don't know. Well, he, he asked me, do you have it? I said, I do. He said, can I see it? I said, you can. He opens it up, looks from Beginning 10, he says, how much do you want? I didn't blink. I said, $850. He didn't blink. He opens up his wallet in the early 1980s, and he gives me 850 US dollars cash. Oh. And he gets off the next bus stop. And I never met him again. 
So what was my reaction? <laughs> right? Of course. Right? Of, of course. course. So while that story ended, and yes, I ended up in New York, but there's a follow-up to the con to the story itself. So I'm in New York. I made it. I got my ticket. I was there. And those who were training me um, advised me that I'm now ready and they, to move on to the next step. After my first Megillah, they, they saw what I was writing. They said, you're fine. You can write your first mezuzah. And then we will put it to a panel of scribes. They will inspect it. If they're happy and all, we'll give you the final stamp. You can go write your test and you'll become qualified as a scribe. So I have written tens of thousands of mezuzahs, many. And by now I'm able to write a mezuzah in about an hour and a half, give or take. This mezuzah took me seven hours to write. It's my first one. Not because I was slow or because I, I was really nervous. <laughs> this is the one that's going to give me the passage. And once I finished writing it, I examined it because unlike in a Torah, which is very interesting, um, if there's a mistake in a Torah, you can actually erase it. And there's different methods of how it's done and rewrite it. In a mezuzah, you may not do so. If there's a letter missing, that mezuzah is buried. It's done. There's nothing you can do. You cannot fix it. Um, the, the concept of it is that the Hebrew word is kesidram, which means that a mezuzah has to be written in order from beginning to end. A Torah does not have that particular rule. And therefore, you can start from the end. You can write this column, that. There's no restrictions on which order you write. You can write the top, you can write the bottom. It makes more sense to write in order. But as far as if you didn't, there's no issue halachically. But in a mezuzah, it has to be written from beginning to end. And therefore, if you missed any letter and you want to go back now and fill it in, you can't. And if there's a swapped letter, broke anything to that effect, that would make the mezuzah pasul, you cannot fix it. So as a result, you don't make mistakes when it comes to writing a mezuzah. So I wrote it and I checked it and I rechecked it and I was now satisfied. So I take it to the scribe who's going to oversee this, the inspection of it. Um, I've written letters and Torahs with, I'm, I say I'm probably close to three quarters of a million people so far who I've written letters in the Torah with. So names is not my strong point. But this person's name, I'll never forget. His name was Rabbi Eli Shevitz. And he says to me, Moshe, it's my first name. He says, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it and we'll call you back a little while from now. He calls me back a little while from now and he says to me, Moshe, I have good news and I have bad news. I said, okay, what's the good news? He says, the good news is, Moshe, it looks like you've been writing mezuzot for 20 years. It's beautiful. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. He says, so what's the bad news? He says, the bad news is your mezuzah is puzzle. It's not kosher. I said, what are you talking about? He said, come and see. What do you mean, come and see? I ran. I come back to him. And he hands me back. How's your Hebrew? Anyone here have good Hebrew? Not good. Any, <laughs> and, huh? <laughs> you know all the letters? Do you know the Shema? You do? It's your lucky thing. I never leave home without it. That is my first mezuzah. That is the first mezuzah scroll that I wrote 41 years ago. And what happened now is he gives it back to me and he says, take a look. So I said, okay, let me look. So I start reading it from beginning to end. I didn't see anything. I says, I don't see any problem. He says, read it again. So I go ahead and read it again, a little slower this time. I didn't see anything. I said, you're just, you know, you're trying to <laughs> deflate my ego. <laughs> you know, because I was like, yeah. he said, no, read it again. So I read it one more time. I says, okay, this is silly. I don't see anything. He goes ahead and shows me that I missed a letter. Now, you know, there's a saying that goes, cowboys don't cry. Heard of that one? I burst out crying. Not too much because I was caught with a mistake, but remember what happened when that guy bought the Megillah off me in the bus? And I said, right? As if this was my sign, I'm destined to be. Equally, in the reverse, I felt that this was my sign, get out while you're ahead. 
on my first mezuzah, on the one that I wrote so slow that I took all the time to check it and recheck it. And then I'm told there's a mistake. And three times I'm going through it. I said, what kind of scribe is that? That's a disgrace <laughs> with respect. See, it's one thing if I want to do my own mess ups in my life, that's my problem. But if I'm going to write a mezuzah and you're going to buy a mezuzah from me, could you imagine? And I am not, and you're going to have something that's not kosher as a result of me and you're trusting me. Maybe God is saying, Moshe, this is not the position you should be in life. And I was extremely distraught. What happened next really set the course of why I'm here today. He put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Moshe, you're going to be a good scribe. So between the tears, I'm saying, you know, what makes you say that? Here, everything went wrong. And despite the fact that you clearly told me and you gave me three chances to find it, I mean, my job as a scribe is to find mistakes, is <laughs> to look through and examine and find. And you're told, in this section, there's a mistake. And I read it once and then twice. And I know the Shema by heart. How can that be? This is really just God's way of telling me, Moshe, we like you. You're a good boy, but get out before it's too late. So this is what he said to me. He said to me a, a, a statement, which I'd been familiar with, and I'm sure you are as well, but he added a piece to it. He said the Torah was not given to the angels. When God chose to give the Torah, the angels actually did ask for the Torah to be given up in heaven. Right? I'm not sure if you're familiar with this Midrash. Um, you know what a Midrash is. Those are the storylines that go along the Torah. So supposedly God went around to all, first to all the various nations and asked them if they want it. And they all said, what's in it? And, you know, one, God said to one nation, it says, don't steal. He said, what do you mean don't steal? We live on that. We don't want it. And then went to another nation, don't kill. <laughs> Killing this is our livelihood. Mm -hmm. And so he went to all the various nations, told them various laws. And they said, we're not interested. Went to the Jewish people. And what did the Jewish people say? How much does it cost? <laughs> and what did God say? It's for free. Give me two. But I'm bummed. But when the Jewish people accepted the Torah, then supposedly the angels came around and said, God, you're going to give Torah? the most holiest concept in the universe to who? You're going to give it to the Jewish people? They make mistakes. Did you find the mistake, by the way, there? I'm comparing it to another one now. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ah, he's smart. The guy's smart. Okay. Comparison is always a good thing. So the angel said, this has the secrets of the universe, the whole information about God and everything around it. And you're going to give it to humans. Humans make mistakes. Humans are promised things. They say, I'll do it. And the next day they forget. They blame everybody else. They're, today they like it. Tomorrow they like something else. The angel said, we'll always take care of the Torah. We understand it and appreciate it. So the Midrash actually continues and says that Moses responds to the angels and says to them, um, do you have parents? To the angel. Angels replied, we don't. He says, but if you don't have parents, how are you going to fulfill the mitzvah in the Torah that says, honor your father and mother? You can't do it. It doesn't apply to you. Good point, Sonny. He said, I'll ask you another question. He said, were you ever slaves in Egypt? Angel said, slaves, one whoosh of my wing, I can wipe out the whole night. What do you mean slaves? He says, yeah, but if you were never a slave and never freed from slavery, you can never celebrate Passover. So the Torah was not destined for you. It was destined for us because we are the ones who can benefit from it, right? Fine. So the Torah is given to the Jewish people. However, one of the other reasons are, is be, in, the, in the more core, is because angel, angels don't make mistakes. Since we make mistakes, we can benefit from the knowledge and the wisdom of the Torah. Rabbi Elishevitz added a piece to it. There's one other disadvantage to angels. And he says, because of that, I would like to certify you as a scribe, he says to me. I said, I'm missing something here. He said, while well, angels don't make mistakes, never do anything wrong. As a result, there's one other thing they can never do. They can never say they're sorry. They can never say, I made a mistake. They can never feel bad for doing something wrong and therefore doing teshuva and repenting. They can never do that. He said to me, Rabbi Shevitz, he said, had I turned around and said, 
Oh, I made a mistake. Oh, no big deal. Give me a few hours. I'll write another one. He said, then I would have worried about you because it didn't bother you. What kind of a scribe is not going to feel the importance and the value of it? The fact that it disturbed you so much, that's what I'm looking for. You're going to be ready to become a scribe. Yeah. So here I am 41 years later. That mezuzah never left my sight. It's always a very humbling experience. I never made a mistake again. <laughs> that mezuzah has always stayed there with me. Did you find it yet? The only difference I'm seeing is on, what are they called? The crowns? The little no. Dormants? No. It's an actual letter missing. I've not seen it. It's in the first, I think, four lines. If I'm not mistaken, on the fourth line, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Two or three words from the end. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> okay. No, ac actually, usually the only ones who ever really get to, when I pass these around, are usually the B'nai Mitzvah kids. Mm -hmm. Because we read words. Once you know how to read, you're not really reading letters anymore. You're reading words, sometimes more than words. People who are fast readers, they're just going like this because they know the pictures of it. And so it's an image that they scan. Younger people who are really just learning how to read and, and they're very so nervous about getting it right, they're literally reading letters and they have more of a chance of picking out where something is missing over there. Um, so that's the story as far as becoming a scribe. And, and here we are. Um, The writing, as you, I mentioned yesterday, is to fulfill those four, Torah, Mezuzah, Tefillin, and Megillah. There's only a handful of scribes who've gone on to now train in the art of restoration. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, there'll be those scribes who are asked to fix and restore. And when they're not qualified, you're getting this. <laughs> you're getting, it's, it's looking terrible. I mean... Not sure how your eyesight is from that, from even from upside down, but it's not going to be that hard to see it. If you see the script here, it's a beautiful mm -hmm. script. Mm -hmm. Now start looking at these things here. Yeah, it's bleeding on the. It's not just bleeding. Look at this the fat it's and the shapes of the letters are wrong. Yeah. Okay, the whole error, and I have errors yeah. which are much much worse than this. Okay, so when you see these big funky letters like this, yeah, they actually look worse because I've just been starting to go over. But they've inherently created really miserably looking and that letters. That part right in there is, yeah. is really, a, I mean, it's, they're not, they're it's, not it's, aligned it's, properly. It's not, nothing, nothing. So that basically is the reason mm. why we say that someone who is a scribe who knows how to write, and that's beautiful, <laughs> that's good, stick with that. Um, I will say that the art of, tra of restoration took me, did take me three years to practice on. We were living in those days in Johannesburg, South Africa. Lived there for 10 years. And there's a rabbi, Yankel Klein. And I was, a, I was doing a lot of things there. I was a pulpit rabbi, vice principal in a school. I did a lot of things. And then every late afternoon, evening, I go to his workshop and I start working on restoration with him overseeing it and get paid for three years practicing it until I got it. You found it? Mexico. Bing, there you go. Yeah, so he found it. Is this parchment or vellum? So it's called parchment. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar um, in the way skin is actually sliced. Um, when you just take the skin off the animal, so you have the outer side, which is where the hair and the fur is, and the inner side where the fat is. Now, they don't even get to do as much anymore, but the common older way of doing it is actually taking that sheet of skin and then slicing it through the middle. And then what happens is one would either write on the side, the inside of the, of the skin with the fur facing outwards or on the inside of the skin with the fat part of the animals. And that's called duchtustus. There's different Hebrew words terminology to it. Um, today, because of more modern technology and all, we're able to just simply slice more on the top, slice more on the bottom to get the piece and it's refined. Again, this is a much older type. The newer ones of a Torah like this size would weigh anything from 50% less to as much as 70% less than what this Torah weighs. It was, it was, 
a bit funny. Um, on Sunday, I was in uh, Phoenix. We just finished a new Torah for the congregation there, an 800 family congregation. And um, we had shipped, I had been already, I'd been there, I don't know, 10 times writing letters with all the families. And Sunday was their closing ceremony. And we had shipped the complete Torah from our workshop in Miami to be ready for the seum for the, for the celebration. And it was there already. They had it in the ark. It was just wrapped up with a talit. And when I came there first thing in the morning, they said, okay, Rabbi Drew, take it out. We still had to write letters with still 100 people that day. And they said, take it out of the ark and put it on the table. And I take the Torah out of the ark and my heart dropped. I had just been, you know, we, I've been working on Torahs. So, you know, when you lift up a chair and then another chair and another chair, this one weighs a little more, a little less, you have a subconscious of the weight of the chairs. It's just the way it goes. I've been working with a lot of Torahs, some probably 20 odd Torahs. So there's a subconscious of how much Torahs are weighing. I take out the Torah. I say, oh boy, someone made a mistake. They forgot to send half the Torah. <laughs> this weighed so little mm -hmm. and it was all there. But the cloth that we had used was a very thin and refined parchment which also is much more durable and will last much longer. Because as you can see with these Torahs, anytime you have a bend in it, it starts creating creases and those creases crack and so on and so forth. The more um, thin it is and the more refined the parchment is as it's being processed, it can actually take the bends. That used to be one of the um, taglines of Mercedes Benz is the car that can take the bends. <laughs> okay, but um, so this cloth has notoriously two issues with it as far as again this is the way Torahs used to be written um, as far as the parchment being made and that is that take one step back and I'll explain further you can walk today into the place that makes the parchment that takes the skins and converts them into um, Torah paper um, one place actually it's hard to believe how they did this but they got a um, airplane turbine engine you know on the wings there's that big somehow they got one of those and brought it into their workshop in Yerushalayim <laughs> this massive they took it all out and that became like this big steering pot if you will where they put the skins inside and uh, with different type of chemicals to remove the hair and remove the fat and the thing is when you take in a big skin and you put it in there when you pull it out it's probably from this big sheet that was put in, it comes out as thin as about this. Literally, it shrinks to almost nothing. Shriver, swiv, a shri what's the word? A shrivels, right. And then they take it and they have these big square boxes with hundreds of little hooks and they hook the piece, the, that little piece onto it and start stretching it. And then they have these little knobs and they keep on stretching it and stretching it and stretching it to get it to the sheet. Um, once it's fully stretched, First of all, it's an ongoing, you keep on stretching it more and more and more and more, but then you start smoothing it down, different sandpaper, different machinery from the outside, the inside. Um, there's different lime that's coated onto it to strengthen it. But you can walk in now once parchment is basically completed, you can walk in and you can purchase all your 62 sheets outright to, buy, to write a whole Torah. One pile to write eh, will cost you about $1,500. The pile over there, if you get from that pile, it'll cost you five, six thousand dollars. They look, they're the same size. You feel them practically the same. The difference is, how thin is it? The more refined and thin means that they now spend two, three more months working on it to refine it. So now, having said that, you don't have to use it on the thinnest one. It's cheaper to write it on the just ready-made parchment. So this one is now two issues. First of all, it's very thick. This is extremely thick. The newer ones are in thickness, half of this. And if you can even understand, you can feel this. If you feel how thick this is, imagine something that's 50% thinner than this. However, the bigger problem is not that, it's the fact that it's been coated with a white paint, if you will, a lime-based, um, uh, acid that they put on the back of it and that practically doubles the weight of the parchment 
So ask me why they do it, <laughs> if it does such a damage as far as weight goes. Well, the one reason why is that they wanted it to look nice and beautiful. You see, when you roll it, it's white. The skin of the animal sometimes have, has different shades, you know, depends which type of color cow it was. So this makes it much more beautiful as far as that goes. Um, but again, there's white coating and there's white coating. There's those that are done very thinly and beautifully and those are just smeared heavy coated. And you can see these things are cracking. Take a look here. Can you see here? Mm -hmm. And I'll just go like that. It just keeps on coming off. See that? And so, and there are places that have much more coming off as a result, but that coating has practically doubled the weight of the Torah as a result. Um, so that as far as the parchment goes. Now, again, I'm, sometimes some of the things I'm gonna be looking for are not only that, but there's going to be little tears and rips, which I'll be mending or patching depending on what has to happen there. Um, there's a few places further down that has some of the stitching that have come loose which I'll be restitching those as well. And the rest of the time, which is 96, 7% of the time will be going over all the letters to make sure that there are none that are cracking and that you can read all of them. That's my job. And some that look really horrible, I'll be partially erasing and then rewriting them. And it's a long, tedious, very, well, you need a lot of patience for it as I'll be going through the whole Torah. Go for some questions. You can't erase. In a mezuzah or tefillah. But here you can. Here yeah. you can erase or remove for that matter. What is it I, name, if it's the name of the author? No. Can't no. So what, yeah. So the thing is like this. If one of the letters of God has now fallen off, so as long as it's not been a incorrect letter that's there, so I can re-ink re it for that matter in a Torah. In a mezuzah and tefillin, you could do nothing with that. Right. If it's written wrong, then does that have to be like cut out? Or yes, so that becomes, if it was written wrong, then it becomes very complicated. Um, then it's not only the word, you'd have to erase a minimum of three words. If you want, it's a technical concept, but I can explain it. Um, every time we start writing, I will always say, L'shem mitzvat ketivat sefer Torah, which means I'm writing this for the sake of fulfilling the mitzvah of writing a Torah. That's what I will say every day, every time I start to write. Um, when you write, when you're about to write God's name, you have to say, L'shem ketushat ketivat Shem Hashem. You have to say, I'm going to be writing now the holy name of God, and you write it. But now here comes, think of the, con the, the um, here's a back end. You can take a pull up a chair. No, just oh, I'm, I'm, I've just got a couple of minutes, but thank yeah, you. Sure, sure, I sure. Um, when a scribe dips his quill, this is a turkey feather into the ink, the most notorious mistake or problem that will ever take place is taking the quill out and immediately going here and starting to write. That's where 90% of all the mistakes take place because the the, the concentration of the ink and just a little bit of a hand like that and a blob falls out. Okay, that's, and it's on the first moment. It's not like four letters later. It's usually when it's fully full. So obviously I, I'm so trained already, no matter what I'm writing, I'm always rubbing on the sides to make sure I don't have that blob. Fine. Now think of it. If I'm about to write God's name and I just pulled out the ink and I start to write, the chance of a mistake happening is on that first letter. So therefore, this is what one has to do. One has to take enough ink to write three words. The word before, then you say L'shem Mitzvah, and say, now I'm writing God's name, continue writing. And there still should be sufficient ink to write the word after. Because if it would, stop, if it would end in the middle of God's name, again, you'd be dipping in the ink and, mm -hmm. and causing the problem. So as a result of a mistake, you'd have to erase, you would have to pull off now three words and you cannot erase it you're talking about cutting out now what happens if god's name is at the end of the line so now you're cutting out from this side and from it becomes a very complicated issue as far as that goes so often and as far as beauty most would suggest simply to take out that sheet and rewrite it because it already would have a blemish on it, especially if it's a new Torah and the community is buying a Torah, they don't want to see patches on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the last thing you want to see. So 
that becomes very much, I mean, that's just one little aspect, but that's definitely a uh, issue to be aware of. But that was a good question. Could we watch you? Um, yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. Okay, any other questions before we start? I just have one. I sure. noticed I noticed these um, the this here. You... Yes, and and I I know what it is. Okay, it's a it's a reinforcement that's Correct. put on the back right. to make sure that the page doesn't. This is apart. true. Right. Is the fact that this is so obvious and arguably bad looking? Mm -hmm. Is that a blemish? Is is well, there, I, I mean, is, I, it's is not. Blemish? It's not a blemish as far as of, of anything halachically. It does not remove in any shape or form the kosher status of a Torah whatsoever. Um, you're seeing this much more because of the water right. which seep through, and that's mm -hmm. so. This Torah definitely is going to have its remaining visual marks of the experience. Um, my job is to say that despite its experience, it still can be kosher. Mm -hmm. So that really is my uh, aim and goal today. So this would be glued on. Well, that's glued on in the back. And the back. Okay. But the seam is just is, is sewn. stitched. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Now, with a lot of time, I can clean all of these things off. I can make the parchment look white, smooth, like you cannot believe. In fact, I'm sure I understand. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> My phone was listening to me. Okay. <laughs> okay, but I'll show you here. Oh, that was the wrong one. Here we go. So this is what there was a part of the Torah looked like. You see that? Mm -hmm. And this was literally glued onto the letters. Okay, so this is the dirt and the red part of it. Then once I fixed it, oh, all right. Look at that. See, so it can look literally completely white mm -hmm. yeah. if I had to. Again, with time, I can do anything. I can make this scroll look brand new, but the time and the cost would say buy a new one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so right now, the, the main objective is to primarily just get this into a kosher status. That, that's the... Since we have to use the yard to read it, how do you go about fixing it without getting like oils from the oil? Okay, so that's a great, great, great question. Um, and I think that's probably one of the most common questions out there. First of all, there's no restriction on touching Torah. Contrary to what most people and communities advise their members. Um, in fact, and my father loves to use this line. He says, it's only when you touch Torah will the Torah touch you. Well, so, hello, you should be touching your Torah. What do you mean? However, uh, and the, the parable comparison is, is if you own a swimming pool, right? What's something that we're, we're technically, even by Jewish law, supposed to put around the pool? And that's a fence, mm -hmm. right? With a handle and a door. Why do you put a fence up? What? Not allowed to swim? You can't swim in a pool? Why put up a fence? If you're two years old, or if you're drunk, you shouldn't be near the pool. <laughs> but if you know how to swim, open the door and go in. Open the fence, right? Okay. So similarly with the Torah. The Torah? Well, anyone could touch Torah. Oh, you're not too sure how to touch the Torah and how to handle it properly? And because we don't want to say, you can, you, well, you, him, I don't know. But <laughs> so therefore, because we don't want to start saying who can and who can't, we say, listen, we're going to make a blanket rule. Rather, no one touches it and we'll never have a problem right like that fence if you know how and you're qualified to you know you've learned how to swim or you have your you know whatever those things the, the, right the floaties right then you may go in other than that it's locked so therefore we say and think of it now from the yad aspect and as far as like if it admits or anyone reading torah i read torah all the time but for someone who doesn't necessarily read it all the time it's could be very nervous. You could become very, it's very nerve wracking. So if you're reading something and you're one of the natural instinctive ways to secure yourself as you're reading, you're pushing it and you're holding it as you're touching it and moving along. That harshness and on the letters will smear the letters, guaranteed. Okay. So therefore, when it comes to reading, we say, let's make just life easy for everyone. I, by the way, when I read, I put out a pink and I just for my hands is up here and I just go like this because I'm not nervous. 
But bring someone else, a friend of mine, and he barely reads and he goes up to read. He's going he's gonna to want to put his hand down because that gives you that sense of security, right? So as a result, we say, let's use a Yad. We'll ha- we won't have any issues. Now, more detailed into your question, I know how to touch the Torah. Um, the problem is not the touching. The problem is the smearing. It's not the hand finger down. It's finger down and rubbing, which most 99% of old people will be touching the Torah because they're reading it. They're not just, you know, looking at it and touching it. They're that the reason why they're next to the Torah is because they're reading. So it's that flow of rolling your finger on it will cause the problem. So normally when I, this is how I will do, and you'll see in a minute, normally what I'll do is I'm going to put my hands on the side here when I have to keep my hands down. And then this part of the hand is I'm going to have it down like this. Again, not smearing. And my hand will just go like this. That's when I can, I'll put it on the side. Again, I try to minimize it, but there's nothing wrong in doing it. Not halachically. And I know I'm not making a mistake either. Um, so I'm very careful on how I'm going to handle it. But when I have to, I will put a finger down in certain places and hold it again, not rolling through. So but that was a very good question. So basically, because of the parchment, the ink is sitting on top of the parchment. It's not absorbed into right, it. Correct. Okay. What and, kind of ink is it? Huh, it's easier to say, go check it out on Rabbi Googlestein. Okay. Okay. Um, he's really smart. This guy, He's been mm-hmm. qualified by every single... but. Rabbi Googlestein often tells us that, no, I'm kidding, but it has copper sulfate, gum arabic, gold nuts. It has ashes of different unique plants. It even has honey. The honey is when you see the little bit of the shine in the letter. That's the result of honey, a little bit of vinegar. Um, but that's not the trick of making this ink. The trick of it is the quantities of each of those ingredients and how you brew it and how you mix it. And that's a secret that only a few families in the world know, and I'm not one of them. Mm-hmm. So anytime we want to purchase such ink, we have to go from one of those sources. Sometimes I may dilute it or mix it a little bit more to my particular liking. Um, but the concentrate of ink is only purchased. So what's, why? I've always, at the beginning, I was asked, what, my, what's the big deal? There's, tell me the ingredients, I'll make my own. So first of all, I did try to make my own. And I kind of... I, I felt like this witch <laughs> brewing it, and I came up with a big pot of black mud. It was nowhere close to ink. Um, it's a very interesting thing because if it comes to answer a very specific question. If someone asks you, how long should a Torah scroll last? What's the longevity of a, of a Torah? What's the lifespan of a Torah? It's thousands. thousands. Of the answer is providing the environment and it's cared for, it can and should last indefinite without putting being put under a glass, you know, like the Declaration of Independence that you have to put on it, you know, proof, airproof and all. If you take care of a Torah, you can look at a Torah hundreds of years later and it should look exactly like this. Again, providing the environment and its care and so on. Um, the oldest Torah scroll that I personally have worked on, um, now it's, it's scratching 800 years old. Um, it's a Torah in um, Temple Emmanuel in Dallas. They have a Torah there that was written in Northern Italy, um, slightly smaller than this. And when you t- take off the cover and you're looking from the outside, the outer size, it looks ex- extremely frail. I mean, you're predicting that, oh, this is like remnants. You open it up, it looks like it was written yesterday. Shining like you cannot believe. It's one of the few scrolls in my career that I've seen that age that looks so beautiful and new. Again, it was able to circumvent all the mess ups of this world and kept on staying in a good environment throughout all these ages, and it's been able to sustain itself. But how do you get ink to last that long? Traditionally, ink disintegrates. If you go and look at your papers that you wrote 40, 50 years ago, the ink that you used, you tell me. <laughs> it's it's turning brown. It's discoloring. Forget about the paper. I'm just talking about the ink itself. You go and see things that are not preserved from 150 years ago, and often you cannot read it at all. Uh, many times we get ketubot from families that they have a ketubah of their parents or grand. They say, please, can you trace the, the, the ink that was used, you know, pen, whatever, because it's completely fading. Hello, hello. We're almost up. Oh, just 
bringing it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm almost finished. Um, Take your time. Well, I had 45 minutes and I'm up to 49. <laughs> and I have a lot of work to do. But um, the answer is, is that the part of the secret of making this ink is to be able to create it in such a way that its core element can last indefinite. That is part of the secret of the making of the ink. So therefore, it's not just a brew of ink that you will use, but it has secretly in, inside of it a mechanism that can last indefinite. And just a side footnote, and this is true stories that have happened in our history, um, we, we often know that, I mean, thank God we're living in a safe country these days, but all of 200, 300 years ago, we were at the mercy of rulers and kings and dukes and princes. And many times they were not very Jewish friendly. And many times they were trying to raise funds for their coffers and wars and whatever they were doing. And who would they go to? To their Jewish people. And often the very few people that knew how to read and write were who? Yours truly, the scribes. Mm -hmm. So often the scribe would be working in the palace by day and then he'd be writing a Torah by night. Right. And the scribe would be writing for the king all his laws and rules and decrees. And this and many times when they made these decrees to the Jews, say, we need you to raise a million rubles. Right. And you have you have a year to do it. And if you do it, we'll let you stay in your house. <laughs> and if you don't, we'll take all your homes. <laughs> so raise the money. Many times they raised the money. Many times they didn't. They were kicked out. And we know of expulsions that were going on all the time. But there are other stories when the king would tell the scribe to go ahead and write down the decree. And the scribe would say, sure, your, your majesty, what's the decree? I want all the Jews, including you, that you're going to have to help raise a million rubles for the coffers of the king. And if you succeed, you can remain in your homes. And if you don't, well, your homes become mine. And the scribe is writing it down and then the king signs it. And a year later, they didn't raise the money. And the king says, I remember we wrote this decree. Let me see what we wrote there. He opens it up and it was blank. Because if you know the secret of making ink that will last indefinite, you know what to remove and make this ink not last. So it really is a very special ink that's used as a result. And it's part of its uh, chemistry is to be able to, as you were saying, to not penetrate, but connect with the parchment and specifically in a very direct way okay okay yeah. the thread that's used that's the sinew of the animal right yeah okay that's what you're seeing over there okay so i'll write a few letters here while you're watching and then i'll go back to my more complex it's always getting the ink to flow. So I'm finding any of the spots that are really cracking because that's going to be the sign that if I don't rewrite them, more will come off eventually. How long does it take the ink to dry? Um, it's in that 15, sometimes 20 minutes, which is not that bad, but not that great. The, each place has its different environment. The, the crowns do on certain letters? Well, it, it's not what they do, but rather that is the image, if you will, of specific letters. Um, now, without the crowns, the letters will be deemed kosher, but they will lose the title of being beautiful. 
So technically those are embellishes to make the letters look beautiful. And yet it's not just for the sake of those embellishes, but rather it does have multiples, endless amount of explanations and meanings behind it. Um, Rabbi Akiva and the Talmud. I'm sure you've all heard of Rabbi Akiva before. Mm -hmm. And he made a proclamation in his lifetime. And he said that if his entire life, all he would have done, because the Talmud is full of his teachings and lessons and whatever. He, he's, he says there that if all his time was devoted to one thing only, and that was to teach the meanings behind the significance of these crowns, his entire life, if that's all he did, he would never have had enough time. There's a lot to be said about these crowns, <laughs> to say the least. And so it goes. So that with the objective is that once this is dry, you're not going to be able to tell I was here. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. And that's the story. How do you know which letter at the ends of the sentences? How do you know which letters to make really wrong? No, you don't. There's no right or wrong. It, the the, the sofer who wrote it, and I'll finish with this because I do need to get back to work. Um, but as you can see, all the lines are justified. Okay, all the mm -hmm. columns. Now, the standard amount of letters per line is 33 letters per line. But every line has a different number of letters. So if you have a line that has 25 letters, so that means that and a scribe usually was not as qualified, what they would do is that they would write normally. And then the last three words, I say, whoops, I have a lot of extra space. And they'll see within those letters, which one can be stretched without changing the look because if you took a vav and you stretch the top it'll become a resh so a vav you can't stretch you can't stretch a yud okay but certain letters you can stretch and they'll still maintain their integrity of what letter it is so if you have a long resh it'll still look like a resh you can have the top of the lamed as long as the top and it's, it's curved correctly so certain letters you will stretch and they will not lose their look and you'll still be able to read it as a resh or a taf and so on um, so when you see those stretched letters, it's because it's a letter, it's a line that has less than 33 letters in the line. And often the scribe, again, a, a really good qualified scribe, you would practically never see a, a stretched letter because we would learn how to already start slightly increasing the size of each letter from the beginning. So you don't have a lot of extra space at the end that now you have to stretch a particular mm. letter. So that's often how you can tell is it a beginner scribe, a middle of his career scribe, or a well-oiled machine of writing? Um, so this this sofer is not a beginning scribe by any means, but he was not at his height yet, because you can definitely see a lot of stretched letters, meaning that anytime you see those letters that are stretched, I could have told you exactly where he could have... Here's an example. Such a good one. I don't know if you want to lean over here and be able to show you. I just saw it there. A really good cough, cough. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. I just saw it a second ago. Good. I mean, really, it's any one of these, but it was one in particular which I just saw. All right, here we go. You see how he stretched yeah. the lamid here? Yeah. Okay. Now look closely. You see this cough? Look at this cuff. You can see this mm -hmm. one's larger than this one yeah. now. How he made all his three cuffs, four, as big as this one and a little bigger even, he would have already reduced this down to here. Had he taken, look at this tough versus this one. You see how small mm -hmm. this one is? Mm -hmm. Had he made all of them just a little bigger, he would have not had to stretch it over here. Yeah. You see that? Now, vice versa, here he got a little bit tight because he made this dollar really big including this bet. He didn't have to make this bet so big. Okay, if he made this bet a little smaller, this kufin talit, a little smaller, this shin yud and men would have not been so squishy at the end. And sometimes you can see, look what have to happen here. Yeah. Because again, he was kind of fairly spacing here and then he gets there and says, oh no, oh no. <laughs> and he starts to, okay. So again, it really has to do with how the scribe is balancing his act. Does every Torah in the world have the same? That's a brilliant question. And I'll end with that question because that really is a good one. The answer is no. 
Well, all the Torahs have all the words in the Torah. Absolutely. Certain parts of Torah always will appear exactly at the same place, no matter what layout Torah you have. Matovu and Parshat Balak will always be at the top of a column. Az Yashir, the Song of the Sea, will always be, there'll be five lines, space, and then Az Yashir. So certain parts of the Torah always appear no matter how you're spaced out. If you have a sheet of five columns, seven columns, sometimes you have Torahs that have, you have Torahs that are um, Czechoslovakian Torahs that they have different size columns. Some are five, six, seven inches. Some are thinner than this because they're trying to fit it into the piece of parchment that they have. When it comes to those spaces, those particular parts of the Torah, they will always appear. The calculation that that sofer has to have to be writing, to make sure he has only five lines left to write at the top there is enormous. And sometimes those who are practicing with those types, you'll see that when they're coming, they have to do those five lines and that's easy to do, but they're supposed to be down here and they're only over here. So you're gonna see these last lines, they're spreading, stretch, 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 because he's only gonna write four or five words in an entire line because he has to finish here to be able to leave the five over there. So, but as far as all the letters and the words, they're all the same. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. This was wonderful. Fantastic. Good, good, good. I look forward to seeing you guys again. Who knows? Maybe have they ever written a Torah here? I don't I don't I think, think so. so. You're kidding. I think so. Wow, how many years has this place been? Uh, hundred and six. Yeah. You're kidding me. You're kidding the first reform one in the city. I did not know that. Put it this way, 30, 40 years ago, when I would visit communities, it was one in 30, one in 40 that had written a new Torah. Today, it's one in 40 or 50 that hasn't. Well, you need to plant that seed. Very interesting, because I was not aware. I was not aware. I took it for granted. I really did take it for granted. One, two different ones, and that might be why we just kind of... Mm -hmm. Between the two. And again, as I said, Torahs are not necessarily being written because we don't have Torahs. It's because you, you, right now in particular, we're trying to bring the families back into the building <laughs> rather than Zoom is great. It's beautiful. And those on Zoom, I hope you enjoyed. But otherwise, why do you need the building for? Yeah. A community is to really embrace one another and dance together and learn together and sit together. Corona really destroyed all of that. Um, and I like to call the, the Zoom a pacifier. You know, yeah. when a little kid's crying, mm -hmm. you give them the pacifier. But if you saw a 12-year-old with a pacifier, that's mm -hmm. not good. You know, so God forbid to say that if someone's ill or, or bedridden or sick, Zoom is, is a God given. Mm -hmm. But if we're healthy and we're capable to get up and go, get up and go. Right. And that's why we have a building to celebrate as a community, not just as individuals and so on. So that's why often communities are writing Torahs. Um, and many times, especially if it was a combination of commu commu few communities together, we're doing a lot of those as well, where they want to say, let's make ourselves into one unit. We've all come from different backgrounds. Let's write one Torah together. So again, this is, um, that's why I was a bit surprised because with the age of the community, I was almost for sure that they had written, but you no, know, no, everything in the good time. So one scribe doesn't write the Torah Several could be doing it, right? Um, yes, but that's not advised. It's not advised. No, because you're going to get a different style of scripts in different yes, places. Yeah. So the, the beauty of a Torah is that it's consistent throughout. Okay. And um, how long would that take? It takes about a year. A year. Approximately a year from the time it's commissioned. And um, but then, but throughout the year, as the scribe is writing those different sections, we then would come facilitate with only with letters that have not been completed mm -hmm. and fill in letters with every family. That's the... The way the way it's done, yeah. But okay, for thoughts for another another time. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, sure. Coming all the way out here. Yeah. Also on the live stream, they've been telling you how to say our city wrong. It's not Louisville. It's Louisville. Louisville. All down. Oh here. boy. Louisville. Louisville. Oh boy. Okay. I should come more often and get learn how to do that one. No, you're not from Louisville. Yeah. <laughs> Any other way than Louisville. Okay, thank you.